皆さんこんばんは、えー。日本以外の。Good evening, everyone, and to members outside of Japan. Maybe it's good morning. Thank you very much for being a part of the Robot Revolution and Industrial IoT International Symposium 2021, despite your busy schedule. Today is day two of our international symposium. Today, theme is manufacturing innovation practice and workforce development we have two members from united states and two members from japan we have wonderful presenters with us i hope that we will be able to have a fruitful discussion with us before going into the session, one request to our audience. During the panel discussion, we are planning a panel discussion for one hour. If you have any question to the presenters on YouTube, there is a link to the QA app slido so please write down your name and title and your question if you have any question let me introduce to you our first presenter from united states sesame clean energy smart manufacturing innovation institute ceo mr john dyke john please Well, good morning and good evening. Yes, my name is John Dyke. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of SESME, the Clean Energy Smart Manufacturing Innovation Institute here in the United States of America. And it's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'd like to share with you some exciting news to kick off my brief presentation we have announced today a bilateral partnership between the United States and Japan to focus on workforce development and harmonization of key technology standards and sustainable and sustainable manufacturing and decarbonization within the manufacturing environment. A, a very exciting and strategic moment for us and for the work that we're doing together to ensure that manufacturers globally can have access to the best education, the best up workforce upskilling capabilities <clears throat> and overall manufacturing strategies that benefit our mutual ecosystems. Just a few brief words about SESME, the Smart Manufacturing Institute, we are funded by the, <clears throat> excuse me, we are funded by the federal government, the Department of Energy, and we are chartered to support the efforts of U.S. manufacturers and the broader manufacturing ecosystem here to drive productivity and create a more competitive manufacturing environment here in the U.S. We're a private-public partnership, and we are focused on these five sets of stakeholders, the manufacturers, the software application vendors, the machine builders, the systems integrators, and of course, academia, working together to solve strategic manufacturing issues for this nation. Our vision, and our charter is to work towards a reality where smart manufacturing is manufacturing by 2030. There are a number of specific strategies that we're working towards, as you can see here. Our overall goal is to drive and accomplish these things through the democratization of smart manufacturing, which is a relentless focus on reducing the cost and complexity 
of manufacturing. We have a roadmap that we've built jointly, we've created jointly with our membership, which defines this ecosystem and the integration of this ecosystem. It defines our enabling technologies that we're focusing on creating for our membership, a strict strategic component around education. And as you'll see in a few moments, some very specific technologies that we call uh, the Smart Manufacturing Innovation Platform, <clears throat> excuse me, and a variety of other important foundational technologies. And on the bottom right here, you see what we call the first principles of smart manufacturing. The important characteristics that we believe are the target or the objective for any smart manufacturing or industry 4.0 initiative that we're working on and building towards here in this work. It's important to recognize that with the many new technologies that are being created all over the world, that what hasn't changed is our manufacturing business outcomes or our desired outcomes. We're still focused on increasing quality, throughput, compliance and safety, and, and of course, decreasing cost and complexity and time to value. New technologies and the fourth industrial revolution have talked for many years now about creating new value. But I think it's important for us to recognize that manufacturers have been working for three to four decades building manufacturing systems that have created a significant set of complexities that we have to recognize as we move from our current way of thinking into the fourth, fourth industrial revolution. And we try to depict that through this set of images where, where this, this represents an actual set of manufacturing systems for a large manufacturer that most of you would recognize. Every single one of these boxes represents a manufacturing system for their plant floor operations. Every one of these systems has its own data store or set of information models. And every one of them has its own unique user experience. And yet here's the, here's the remarkable reality. At the end of every shift in each of these manufacturing plants, and there's roughly 70 of these manufacturing plants across the world, they spend 40 hours reaching into these systems and pulling data from these systems for the most part manually, bringing them into Excel or into some other dashboarding environment and printing these reports so that they can have a shift handoff from one shift to another for production, for maintenance, for quality. And so this represents a significant headwind for any new innovative technologies that we have to recognize as we think about strategies going forward. And as we here at SESME have tried to identify the best ways to enable smart manufacturing and to remove some of those headwinds, this is what we've identified through our analysis. The reality is that for every dollar that a manufacturer spends on a solution to help them with their smart manufacturing objectives, there are somewhere between four and five additional dollars spent on systems integration, on infrastructure and networking, and of course, of course on uh, compute and data store. And it's these costs and, and, the, and the accompanying complexity that prevents many of these manufacturers from deploying these systems, particularly in their small and medium-sized plants um, across the world. And so from our perspective, we believe it's vital to compress those costs and to eliminate costs, almost like waste in a value stream. We've identified significant waste where we believe we can reduce the cost of implementing and of infrastructure and of data compute and store by leveraging new technologies and creating new standards for how 
or de facto standards for how information is used to solve manufacturing problems. We believe and we'll demonstrate <clears throat> are, are demonstrating this year in 2021 that we have significantly, in fact, by 50% cut the cost and complexity of manufacturing systems. Let me share one more perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on how we see this. Every industrial revolution for the past several hundred years has resulted in a very specific productivity and value curve, as you can see here. The interesting expectation 10 years ago when we first began talking about the fourth industrial revolution is that we would have a very similar productivity curve. In fact, uh, there was much conversation about $10 trillion of new value creation over the first decade of the fourth industrial revolution. I think it's important to recognize and to truly understand that we have not seen that boost in productivity, at least here in the US, our manufacturing productivity has declined by 10%, I'm sorry, has declined for the first time in 10 years, um, as, as we see here. And we believe that a big component has been this set of complexities that and, and costs that have constrained manufacturers from adopting smart manufacturing technologies. And that the characterizations or the description of the result of industry 3.0, if I can call it that, has been proprietary and closed systems characterized by lack of interoperability, uh, vendor lock-in, no application portability. Each of these represent an, an important set of challenges that we need to understand and address going forward. If we're gonna have a, a future marked by a reduction in cost and complexity, if we're gonna have a future that's different from the trajectory we're on today, it'll be because we work collectively, both nationally in the US, but bilaterally with great partners like our friends here in Japan to collectively address those challenges and create a new set of objectives for manufacturing systems. And we call these, as I mentioned before, the, the first principles of smart manufacturing uh, marked by interoperability and openness, sustainable and energy efficiency, security, stability, uh, scalability rather, and so on. And it's, it's important for us to recognize that this is as much a cultural issue as it is a technology issue. And so from our standpoint, the work that we're doing here um, and, and focusing on, we'll be focusing on together through our partnership uh, with uh, RRI is to drive a new set of behaviors and a new set of standards together to bridge this chasm and accelerate the ability of this ecosystem to move from the old way of doing things into a new way of doing things. This is the only way we believe that we'll actually achieve our objective of smart manufacturing 2030. I have alluded to the smart manufacturing first principles, which I've highlighted here and don't have time to allude to or, or elaborate on today. But I think this is an important set of ideas that we will, will uh, focus on going forward. Um, SESME's efforts fall into these four categories, enabling technologies, um, a national smart manufacturing learning infrastructure, uh, a national ecosystem to engage all manufacturers, particularly including small and medium manufacturers, and of course, the ability in a vendor neutral way to drive collaboration, to, to advocate for standards and, and uh, harmonization of efforts. A big part of this is what we call our smart manufacturing information uh, and innovation platform. This is our implementation of some really important smart manufacturing technologies and standards. These are all open standards that we've developed as an ecosystem to uh, simplify and reduce cost and complexity for US manufacturers. Another important strategy is national reach and uh, addressing the manufacturers where they are in every industry that they represent. We've just 
announced um, the selection of several new innovation centers across the country, representing several additional new manufacturing industries for us to focus on. And last but not least, and this is a big part of our focus together with the RRI, is education and workforce development. The idea that we engage our marketplace, both nationally and globally at scale, that we deliver both formal and informal education, that we address the needs of not just the large enterprises, but the small and medium enterprises as well, that we uh, have a clear sense of the roles that we're addressing. And we've called some of those out here in terms of the entire spectrum from business executives um, plant leadership, operations and IT leadership, all the way through to the smart manufacturing professionals and those that are implementing standards, um, as well as the student and the talent pipeline in the middle. Let me close with one final slide here just to, to share with you that um, as I started by saying today that we are thrilled to embark on this partnership with the robot revolution and industrial IoT initiative out of Japan. This marks a, a strategic effort um, and, and, and working together with our friends in Germany in a similar way to focus on these strategic initiatives to drive the harmonization that's so vital for what is essentially a global manufacturing community and that will serve our countries well. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I hope this has been helpful and I look forward to the partnership and to the, the work that we'll be able to um, work on together in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, CEO Daik. Next. Let me introduce to you our second presenter. Dr. Sato, Professor Emeritus of the University of Tokyo. Dr. Sato has been working on talent development, especially in the field of robot. He's been supporting the current Japanese robot education and industry. Thank you for your kind introduction. I am Professor Emeritus of the University of Tokyo. Tomomasa Sato. I have been in the field of robot research for over five decades. Recently, in order to really actualize the robot, not only the research of robot itself, but the research of the city is important. So along with smart factory, I am trying to include smart city, so city building for robots. That is a part of my research, and I am involved in robot education too. So today, I would like to talk to you about engineering education in Japan, the examples and the future of robot education in our country. The first slide, please. I have two topics I'd like to talk about. First, what kind of talent is needed? Here I call it STIM, Science and Technology Innovation Matrix. Sorry, there's a typo. And secondly, about the examples for the polytechnic technical courage and also recurrent learning for people in the industry. First of all, what to learn, what kind, even before what kind of talent we want to develop, I want to explain what we should be learning. This chart shows for us to become a leading robot nation, what kind of activities or actions were taken. I call it the innovation matrix. The y-axis are in four stages. In order to change the society with technology, this type of innovation, the first step will be the lab laboratory stage, the research in labs. And secondly, it will be the social experiment stage, if it can be accepted by the society. Stage three will be the commercialization stage. If it is an important technology for the society, it shall be 
commercialized and stage four not just the product itself but we have to build the whole industry and environment through these four stages i believe that japan was able to become a leading nation of robots and what kind of actions should be taken there are eight number one it takes time so first of all it is important that we have a grand design a grand vision which will lead us all through the way number two because we are in a capital society we need a business model so the science and innovation of course we need research and development number three so grand design business model r and d all of these three things which seem quite different should be all integrated number four and then implemented in the society poc and then if needed the market should be developed then awareness raising education and based on that we would need regulations and rules that's number eight social system reform i believe it is constituted of these eight phases that's the x-axis and i have divided it into p d c a so four times four matrix this is based on the activities which actually kawasaki heavy industries took in order to bring robots to japan first of all khi brought in the robot technology from a venture company in the united states that was plan and next for do they actually made the robot in-house prototyping then after that they did a long-term experiment operated for two three months they then find out that for the gears and the motors it deteriorated they found the challenges and they fixed it and finally they made a safety standard of course it's an industrial robot so sometimes there could be anomalies uh, they have to find out how they can keep it safe and then after that it goes into the social experiment stage we go to the second phase first of all look at go put the robot and the user's site for operation and in that plant of course there are engineers mature engineers who will find out what is insufficient of that experimental robot how reliable it is or the safety they will be able to find out the challenges at the actual site and one by one they conducted improvement i know that there were a lot of struggles but i they tried to overcome that in order to bring a change to the society and the very far right, uh, they maximize the on-site acceptance to for the commercial phase. So business model, they found out that if they shouldn't be selling uh, that something which will be at the far end, like the hand, the finger uh, part of the robot they shouldn't be selling that it's better to sell the arm part so that it could be used in many occasions um for that uh, not the hand but the arm and they they would need lots of difficult phases like the welding and assembling but the users were very interested so they worked with them and they decided to sell it to the industry for example the automotive industry to build it the environment as a robot industry so with various phases they were able to actually implement a robot in actual plants each of the in examples this shows about the three decades that japan took in order to bring the robot to actual business phase uh, if a company tries to change a society with innovation i think these are the steps and phases a company should be taking and i'm trying to explain about this analysis so first it's important that we build the r d the technology that's the lab phase number one and number two is the social experiment number three is commercialization number four the industrial phase respectively in blue red green and purple and when i did a hearing for a uh, 
local government for industrial robot how the company should be evaluated and the scores are shown right here the scores are decided by the committee members for example company a r and d 8.57 out of 10 commercialization 8.29 and company c the r and d is 5.14 but commercialization 5.71 which means company a is basically good in all the phases but on the other hand company C they are only doing number two social experiment and a very low score on other phases and three years after that when the same company made a similar proposal the result was the same basically the same which means that in order to transform a society they are not conscious about the elements needed to actually make an innovation and change the society. That is why even how hard they try, it only stays in the phase of social experiment. I believe that is why it's important to raise more awareness and understanding for the Japanese engineers. So the engineering education in Japan The overall, when I was in university, first we learned through classroom lectures, but recently we have project module driven learning, which means trial, challenge, a contest. They try that and then they make their failures first. Trial, challenge, contest, fail and find out what's insufficient and what they need to improve. Through experience, after that, they start learning. Um, I think that is the trend globally and what I also think is important to bring into Japan. What we started in Polytechnical College, so uh, OECD highly evaluates the Polytechnical College education in Japan. Why? It is because they have internships, practical experiment and robot contest and on-site factory training. So they not only move their heads and brains, but they also move their body and they learn through experience. Also, it is highly validated because the Polytechnical College in Japan is uh, studying through high school and college at the, in the same place. They do group work from the age of 15. So when they evaluate the technical college education, uh, this is an evaluation by the education experts. Why? They, how they evaluate, if they evaluate through the income, job title, and self-satisfaction they will be able to gain in the future, which means income is the evaluation from the society and job titles evaluation from organization. Satisfaction is evaluation for each individual. If it meets all three criteria, it means it is a good education. So what we need is the current social economic knowledge, general purpose ability, and so on. But what is special about the technical college is what they learn in a technical college can be instantly implemented in the society. And this type of education, they start from age 15 and continue that education until they go into the society. We. I believe that uh, learning through being involved in a contest is important, and that's what I started. This It's this robot social implementation contest. Usually, contests have a set criteria, but ours is an open issue, which means you, the students need to come up with a service concept, and based on that, they should be building their robots not only building the robots they have to bring that into the actual site the plant and then they will be listening to the feedback of the people on site and we evaluate not the result but actually evaluate the process what kind of learning process they went through this was the contest 
we held. They challenge, of course, um, they build their own robots. It is difficult. However, when things start to work, then it will really enlighten and ignite the students' hearts. They will have a passion and it has a very positive impact, not only for the students, but also for their parents. And they will be able to learn and work on it as a group. So, and they can even learn about the tactics and strategy. They will learn about the soul rules that they will probably use in the society. Well, it's not a good word, but sometimes even to deceive. And also they can learn about uh, social implementation, co-creation, which will lead to social implementation. And also they will listen to the user's voice and they will be evaluated from others. So it will, the students will really be passionate. First, we started in 2011, three teams, but at the peak, we had like 70, over 70 teams from 19 technical colleges. And we, we were really able to expand this uh, contest. This social implementation contest, I believe that this process includes all of the matrix of what I explained in the social implementation. First, thinking about the service, this is equivalent to the grand design and the social experiment model is needed for the contest. I think that is equivalent to the business model I explained for science, technology, innovation, and R&D system integration. Field experiment is equivalent to POC, and listening to the users is the same as marketing. And also you might have to persuade it is awareness raising and education. And for example, for students with special needs, uh, for schools with special needs, they sometimes have to finish the experiment until 5 p.m. or something. There are rules like that. So I think that the sets of rules is same as the social system. So it includes all the things needed for the science, technology, innovation. In the same way, we are trying to work on recurrent education. This is about building a robot system we call the system we call them SIRs or system integrator. What kind of education we do is we choose a factory. And for example, we have four teams or 20 members each. They first visit the factory, have a factory tour. But even before that, they ask a real announcer how to conduct a hearing and a presentation they learn how so sometimes it's difficult to get the answer they want from the president so they learn the skills for that hearing and then they visit the factory and find out the challenge where they want to switch to a robot and they have a mid interim uh, proposal and the SIS uh, system integrators and professors and the management people, they will provide a feedback to the students and they will ask and they will find out all the parts uh, which is not enough. And in the latter half of this training, uh, they will visit the factory again and then uh, go into the final presentation. When they do this presentation, if they know about the grand design, the overall situation, I think that the students will be able to learn more and understand more and lead to a better outcome. And we do the same thing for university students too. At Tokyo University, they move into their special fields from the second grade. So they first do some um, ex experience, training, learn about math, and then human after that. Uh, so first they have their general knowledge building phase. And from the second of grade, they go into robotics, human integrates others, and then they go into knowledge software exercise and the bachelor's thesis in the fourth year. So this is something I believe is quite similar to what I've been explaining until here. This is for the future. But as explained, 
Robert, I believe, is a really good uh, educational material. So from, I think, uh, elementary school to high school, they can learn based by curiosity and then science technology. After that, um, not just interest, but build that into an engineering social implementation. And then uh, when they graduate from university, I think it will be a skill that they can use in their field and job. So I want to build this whole stream of robot education. Uh, this is the summary, um, A and B, what kind of talent is needed, I tried to explain through the social implementation matrix, the procedure to transform and innovate the society. I want people to understand this matrix, and B, I, I tried to explain about the detail, what we're actually doing in technical college and recurrent learning. I try to share with you the examples. Uh, this is what I'm working, and I hope that we can collaborate with members of the United States uh, for better manufacturing. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Pato. Let us now move on to the next presentation. Again, this is a presentation by our American speaker. We have Mr. Sanguinich from General Mills, which is a food manufacturer, leading manufacturer of food products. We'll be able to listen to what they have done to achieve the innovation. So, Mr. Sanguinich, would you like to start your presentation, please? Hi, good evening. Um, first, let me just give you a little bit of background about General Mills. You might not be familiar or really familiar with our company. We're a food manufacturing company. Um, probably some of the brands or products you might be familiar with are haagen ice cream. Um, we produce that out of our, uh, mainly out of our location in France. So we're a global uh, food manufacturer, but we have a lot of other products. Uh, we use yo yogurt, which is YoPlay. Yogurt is our, our brand for that. We have a lot of cereal products. And, and other innovation products. So um, please go ahead and show my slides. So let me start by saying we had, uh, we've been with SESME for several years now. We were part of the beginning of the SESME organization. We were able to participate and, and help with that. And this, this project that I'm going to talk about is a partnership with SESME and one of their key uh, technology providers, ThinkIQ. Uh, so that's a core technology that uh, is in the SESME innovation platform. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this one project that we worked with SESME about, which is called inferential modeling to drive out energy and waste. Next slide, please. So again, the goal of this is to drive out energy waste. Um, and I'm going to first start with a simple analogy so that you can understand what the uh, overall goal was or, or just try to explain a little bit of the approach. So we have, um, like, say your house, you have an energy meter that shows how much energy your house is consuming. But we really wanted to get down to, let's say, what the different appliances in your house were using so that you could make decisions about what you were doing with those appliances. For example, some appliances will tell you how much energy they consume, but not all of them. So the inference model is to say, I know the total amount of energy I'm using. I know when the different appliances are running. So can I infer how much energy is being consumed by each one of those appliances, even if I don't have an actual sensor on that device to measure how much energy consumption there is? So in a house, you have a very limited number of appliances, but in our manufacturing plants, we have many, many appliance or many, many motors and pieces of equipment. So we had a five-step approach the first step was to really model um, our systems. And it was really around modeling the production flows. So how 
production flowed through the plant and how materials flowed through those plants, and then also how energy flowed through the plant. So creating that kind of base model. And then we went through by using a lot of contextualized data, knowing when those different uh, pieces of equipment were running uh, and what products they were running, we would build kind of an inference model by pieces of equipment. That third piece is how do we start understanding what actual product or when those pieces of equipment were actually running to kind of predict the consumption then by an actual production run. Then we would also try to continue to refine by adding more context. And this context now becomes the actual product um, SKU that was actually running. So an example would be, am I running vanilla ice cream or am I running a chocolate with um, chunks of chocolate in it? Those are gonna be two different products that might have a different energy profile. And then the last thing is obviously to then provide um, some kind of simple, friendly analytics or graphics or information so that people can help make decisions. So if I step back, this energy inference project will not save any energy. It only basically allows you to understand where energy is being consumed and that information and knowledge then will allow you to take action to try to drive out that waste. Next slide. So I'm gonna cover um, lessons learned and then I'm gonna talk about some of the other opportunities and benefits we had. We first um, put this project in a facility in Murfreesboro. It's a location in one of our plants. And this factory produces Yo'll Play yogurt. The reason we chose this facility is this facility actually had a lot of metering or actually sensors to understand energy consumption. So this allowed us to have a good baseline and understanding of is the model actually giving us the information that it's predicting. So we could have a checkpoint. Um, one of the things that we were able to, to learn is that we could model both product material and energy flows with one single model. We also had um, the need to make sure that we were able to group that information by production runs, meaning I'm gonna run vanilla ice cream for three days. So I have that all the energy consumed for that run rolled up. Also, I wanted to understand a weekly energy uh, roll up. And this would be by a skew. Again, a skew would be vanilla, chocolate, the different actual flavors and different sizes of those then by the actual production line, and then finally by site. Uh, we also had to normalize and com um, compare consumption across runs. So this is, this is an important aspect. Um, like many other um, things that you want to measure, you want to normalize those so that you're looking at something that you can compare that makes sense across different things. Um, the last thing, or a couple other ones, highlight consumption by production line that's usable by the production team. So again, how do we make sure that we are taking these measurements and then providing them in a way that our production teams um, can actually do something to reduce that energy consumption? And again, the last point is making sure that is very usable for the production team. The next slide, please. So the first plant that we looked at, the Murfreesboro plant that I just talked about, had a lot of instrumentation and measurement capability. Now we try to say, how can I apply this same model, leveraging the SESME platform? Since it was cloud-based, we could easily now uh, move this to another facility and take advantage 
of that platform. But this facility did not have a lot of instrumentation. So this facility had obviously our incoming power and it had some major instrumentation, but not the granularity to equipment. So we were still able to get significant um, results and measurements, even though there weren't the same amount of sensors and measurements that were capable in our first plant that we did. Other lessons were, we understand that large infrastructure um, items, so think of air compressors that are supplying air to the entire facility. Um, maybe it's ammonia or cooling um, that's providing it, uh, HVAC systems. Those were big energy consumers um, that we found that sometimes don't get looked at because they're not actually producing the products. So those were important um, for us. And the other thing that we learned as we went through a, to a facility that didn't have a lot of instrumentation is really understanding the products that were running on the system and then being able to correlate that and seeing the different amount of energy the different products use. And in this facility, that um, was a lot of manual data. So operators would be actually telling the system what product they were running. This was a good lesson learned, as most of you know, as we're, we're relying on data to produce these results. If our data is inaccurate, we're not gonna get the accurate results we're hoping for. Next slide, please. So the outcomes on the Murfreesboro side, this was the first plant we did that had a lot of instrumentation. We saw a lot of great results. Um, the team was able to start looking at energy as an ingredient, understanding the different products and what products were using more energy. Then they were also looking at this key metric, this normalization of energy. It was the last bullet here energy utilization efficiency. That was the metric we were able to use to kind of normalize and look at things similarly, even though there were different products running on different lines. Next slide, please. In our Chanhassen facility, this was a facility that did not have a lot of instrumentation. The things we realized and the outcomes we understood there were we really see, saw a lot of wasted energy during periods when no product was being produced. So we would have maybe 10 to 12 manufacturing lines, but only maybe six to eight running at a given time. And so we were using a lot more energy, but underutilizing because we had lines that weren't being produced. So this really came back to optimizing our schedule, when to run different um, products and what lines to actually run those on. Um, and changeovers, which would mean I'm going from one product to a different products, we're actually using a lot more energy than we thought. So again, this drove more behavioral changes to help drive out energy. So this was very um, impactful. Even though we didn't have a lot of measurements, we were still, or a lot of instrumentation, we were still able to infer and get those energy results that helped us drive different behaviors to drive out energy loss. And can you go to the next slide? So I wanna kind of pull this back. So we were talking about the technology and the, the ability for us to now have information without having to spend a lot of capital to uh, put instrumentation in to understand that. But as I said earlier, the biggest value of this information is that it's actionable and that the actual operators and teams can actually use that information to make changes and drive out waste. So we are on a, a journey to install what we're calling a connected worker platform um, to develop and make sure that our operators and team leaders have that information to actually drive out waste um, not only energy waste, but all, all other kind of waste. Um, so when we're looking at this new um, platform, 
obviously some of the things that we wanted to do is move from paper to electronic. So leveraging some new technologies to help with not only visible visibility to information, um, information that we were just talking about of energy of production, but also how do we provide them with um, clean inspect and lubricate um, checklists, center lining. Um, more importantly, if there is a question, how does that operator, that technician have access to help, whether it's an equipment failure, maybe there is an energy consumption that is higher than normal. How can they easily get information to help them reduce that failure or reduce that energy consumption? It also is gonna help us with scheduling. As we talked about earlier, scheduling is a big key in helping us reduce energy cost and these things. So how do we put that information at the fingertips of the people that are making the decisions in real time to drive out waste? Um, and, and then lastly, um, on this worker platform, how do we really have a platform that is going to be able to do what we need it to do today, but also be able to build and continue to develop our workforce in the future? Um, you know, what, what systems are in place? What are the gaps that we have? And, and that could vary from our facility, from facility to facility. So we need to kind of do those things. So I, I kind of wanted to pull it back to that workforce development. You know, it was really the initial thing was how to reduce waste and energy, but it really comes back to the workforce that is going to be driving the changes to make an impact and really reduce the energy. So thank you very much. That was my presentation. Hopefully that was informative and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much again for having me speak today. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanginetti. Please let me introduce our fourth speaker. CEO of Doha Technos, Mr. Hirokazu Ono, Reality of DX Human Resources at SME's Current Workforce Development Challenges and Admissions for the Future. Mr. Ono, please. Good evening, everyone. And our friends from the United States, good morning. Thank you for your introduction. I am Ono from Doha Technos. We have a headquarters in Kita Kyushu. We are a trading company supporting manufacturing. We are trying to solve various challenges for companies. Today, I would like to speak to you about the reality of DX, especially human resources at SMEs from the viewpoint of Gemba or actual workplace. I would like to explain to you what we are doing, the reality of DX, and also what we are trying to work on for DX talent development. The promotion of DX in Japan and a collaboration, a global collaboration for the future. I hope it might be some kind of hint or reference to you. Now, today's agenda. First of all, in section one, I would like to explain about the reality of the ex human resources at SMEs, the challenges we might face and how we can success make succession of technologies and what we are doing, the challenges we are trying to work on for DX talent development. And in section two, once again, in the past two years, there has been drastic changes. So I want to explain about the macro trend and the people's values. And in this type of environment, how we should respond as a small, medium sized enterprise and Kita Kyushu, where we have our headquarter regarding talent development, what are the actions we can take? And finally, I want to explain about the ambitions we have for the future. Let me begin. This page regarding HR development in Japan, especially SMEs, what is the current status? What we can say is, especially in small and medium-sized enterprises in Japan, tacit knowledge is still the mainstream and not yet translated enough into explicit knowledge. 
which means people try to express explain using expressions based on subjective views or one's senses and sometimes they don't even use words but tell them to learn through observation or just doing the job this type of analog style this might be based on lifetime employment a special unique to japan or even rejection towards digitization but i think that this gap of tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge is equivalent to the gap between generations that is why appropriate succession of technology is not conducted and there are challenges this type, this type of analog mindset brings the rise in turnover of younger employees the difference in values among different age groups this has become apparent and become an actual management challenge this type of technology succession and this lack of uh, explicit knowledge this is be a huge challenge for management and lower productivity it is important that we have to understand there is a difference in values and also between generations not just the management but all the employees along with the mass production and better uh, when the economy was rising, it, there is, of course, a gap in the current status where we see a stagnant economical situation, diversification of goods and services. It is natural that the values differ, so it's not a matter of right or wrong, but we have to understand that there is a difference. There should be an integration and there should be a balance in the companies of tacit and explicit knowledge. This is the discussion that we have to behold. I know it's a grand old idea but leveraging digital to bridge different values. I think this is what DX means for corporate talent development. Now I would like to explain about the actions for filling the gap. In our company, we have uh, multiple projects, especially related to IoT. We are trying to bring in younger generations as much as possible. We have our original product called Maruto IoT, and also we have Evo Software, which is the German made software at hometown of Industry 4.0. And we are working on full introduction to the Japanese market with the four power of younger generation and we are trying to train the executives and middle management change their mindset so they won't say it's impossible but rather support the younger generation i think that we are able to penetrate the understanding of the ex in our company recently we held a brain games and riddles this is a game online it's an internal team building event and we witnessed that the younger generation with their flexible brains uh, they were able to answer the question and team leaders were able to provide more opportunities and let them the younger generation to maximize their performance now our actions are not just inside our company, but even outside our company. There are challenges which we cannot solve by ourselves, but we try to collaborate with our private network and in our region. We are, are part of Kita Kyushu System Integrator Network. It is an organization. We try to share challenges about talent development and try to share about the examples, uh, the good examples of talent development. And also we are trying to have communication of younger talents between companies and we for example had the exhibition event shown in the right bottom the robotics demo system by younger generation trying not to ask for the moon that nothing nothing that we not something we don't have but rather solve the problems with the resources we have now in the small and medium sized enterprises I did explain about the actions that we are trying to take, and I believe that we are going for the better. But I think now is the time we need further actions. Due to COVID-19 and global scale natural disasters, I think it displayed to us the uncertainty of the market. And also in Japan, there's a problem called 2025 digital cliff, the delay in DX and the gap and discrepancy in the digital capability. This is a business risk for us. The society and business, the situation is rapidly changing day by day. Also, there's SDGs and also post-COVID, there is 
a new value called D growth. So the direction that the regions and companies are aiming for is also changing. I believe that we are in a tough environment. What is something we can do? I want. I believe we have to think about our further actions, our next step. In a rapidly changing society and the business environment, we have to be prepared and solve the issues of companies and regions. I believe it is essential that we have a collaboration between industry, government, and academia. By expanding this relationship, and there too, we shouldn't ask for the moon, but we have to understand we have the stars, fully leveraging the resources we have in the region. And we hope to foster talents in our region. In Kitakyushu, there are multiple actions taken for the industry academia government relationship. For example, FACE, Kitakyushu Foundation for the Advancement of Industry Science and Technology, or Chelsea, the Consortium of Human Education for Future Robot System Integration, a select a school is called National Institute of Technology, Kitakyushu College. Let me explain about some examples. First of all, in National Institute of Technology, Kitakyushu College is a technical college. We're working on Industry 4.0 executive business school program and we are trying to develop industry academia digital manufacturing core talents it is uh, for developing the x talents and we are able to have a great teachers for example mr fujino of nri and also kita kyushu city uh, they are fully supporting us, which means that it is truly a holistic program of industry, government, and academia. And also, we are they are working with the local uh, businesses for the cooperative education program called Compass. So the uh, companies of Kitakyushu, they are telling the uh, technical college students about the actual situation of the X and technology in the field. I believe that there will be even more programs and lectures about the X. Uh, back, the background is the difficulty and challenge we face uh, in the society and business environment, but if we are able to share even more about the direction we should lead, head to and about the future, I believe that practical learning through collaboration it will be a more dynamic one for the future. As I explained, uh, we are taking multiple actions for the collaboration between the industry, government, and academia. I think it is moving to a good uh, direction. However, even if uh, this type of learning is provided, it should be fully leveraged in the society, and we need a mindset so that it can be a full resource for us. This type of mindset and corporate culture is needed, and they will that with that i think the students will be able to understand that they are really contributing to the society and there should be a diversification of career paths that uh, they can work in various industries and jobs this type of environment should also be prepared for the talents the Kitakyushu Technical College uh, students, approximately 90% of the graduates actually work outside of Kitakyushu city. Of course, they are, are a wonderful talent for Japan. However, since it is a regional program that we are providing, are we really able to provide a mindset for the students? Maybe there could be some kind of reversal effect. Uh, so we have to think about further ways that uh, the students will be able to understand or think about contributing to the region and our ambitions for the future I explained to the activities in our companies in the region I said that filling the gap between generations is what DX should be aiming for as SME I want to continue to take take actions to develop talents of DX. And in our region, I think it is important to transcend the boundaries of industry, government, and academia to provide a seamless environment and the learning and action. I think we should build a virtuous cycle and that would contribute to the development of future talent 
DX talent. Kita Kyushu making a city of manufacturing where DX human resources will shine with a lively lively work environment. I would like to contribute as Doha Technos to this industry government academia collaboration in Kita Kyushu. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Ono. So we have just completed the four presentations. Spending the remainder of our time, we would like to begin the panel discussion, including the four speakers. I'd like to show you the slide. So these are our four panelists who already spoke. We have about one hour, so I'd like to divide that hour into four parts. Next slide. As you can see, these are the themes that we want us to discuss. First of all, in the manufacturing industry, especially focusing on smart manufacturing, what is the mission and meaning of WFD? Workforce development. And secondly, what are the value of collaboration? So that will be the second topic for us to discuss. And thirdly, we would like to focus on SMEs. What are the tools and opportunities that we should give to small and medium-sized enterprises? And lastly, number four question, as Mr. Dyke mentioned, we just announced RRI and SISME collaboration. So we would like to discuss international collaboration on smart manufacturing. That will be the fourth topic. We would like to spend 15 minutes for each topic. So to start off, very first topic. In the context of smart manufacturing, what is the mission of workforce development? So let me give you several questions to Mr. Dyke and Mr. Sanguinetti. So when you think of smart manufacturing, it's not just installing sensors in the factory. You need to look at the value chain and how the value should be created throughout the value chain. If you look at the U.S. manufacturing, do manufacturers understand the value of smart manufacturing? Especially in the factory floor, we have operators and at the same time, top leaders, the management team. To what extent do they understand that smart manufacturing and its value? So that will be the first question. And when manufacturers work on human resource development for smart manufacturing. What are the reasons that actually make them, motivate them to start doing this education? Can I ask this question first to Mr. Dyke, please? Yeah, that's a, it's a great set of questions. I'll do my best to remember both of them as I respond here. <clears throat> I, I think uh, there's been a growing recognition over the last, um, I would say, 10 years or so that manufacturing data and analytics, and most recently the, the focus on the industry 4.0 technologies, that there's some real value to be created uh, using some of these ideas, these methodologies and, and technologies. But I think there's still been a significant uh, disconnect between the folks that understand at a macro level that there's value here and the practical realities or the implications of how that turns into value in a manufacturing operations environment. I think the really interesting challenge is that the, the continuous improvement, Lean, Six Sigma, all of those great quality related and continuous improvement initiatives have done a great job driving out waste
from the process side and have aided the development of new um, products and um, leaning out those processes. But information from the plant floor to drive that sort of continuous improvement strategy is still not where it needs to be. And so I think part of the part of the effort that we want to focus on, and we'll talk more about this later, I'm sure, but part of the effort that we need to focus on is to inform every set of those stakeholders from the talent pipeline coming out of school, coming out of our community colleges and our universities, to the operators on the plant floor, to the practitioners that are implementing systems, and all the way up to the executive office where strategic initiatives are decided upon and are funded. That entire life cycle, that entire set of stakeholders needs to be much more informed on how data translates into value. It's a complex challenge, but I think it's one that we have to embark on. We all know that technology is an important part of this fourth industrial revolution, but it's probably second, it plays a second role to the cultural environment in which these technologies will be implemented. And so in the same way that we've created disciplines around uh, process and material science and uh, all of these other academic disciplines that have matriculated their way into uh, the workforce and into manufacturing operations, we have to build a whole new discipline around information value. If we're going to drive digital transformation successfully into our manufacturing ecosystem, uh, we're going to have to build that mindset across the entire set of stakeholders that we're all working with. Hi. Yes, go ahead. I would add one more really important piece. This disruption requires more than just individual vendors and individual technology providers to drive these ideas across the industry. This requires much more significant engagement from um, the, the federal government, uh, from academia, and from the actual manufacturing stakeholders uh, that, that I mentioned before, the systems integrators, the machine builders, the vendors, and of course, all of the manufacturers. So this is a comprehensive, disruptive opportunity for us here in the US and uh, in Japan and around the world, I believe. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Sanguinetti, would you like to also respond to this question? Uh, yes, thank you. And I agree with everything John has said. Um, I think I'm going to look at this a little differently in the context of the last year and what has happened. So, there has been a significant change in. Um, the amount of people we have for our workforce, which is driven um, management at all levels from our CEO down to, you know, people on the floor, trying to understand how smart manufacturing can enable us to make it through um, the pandemics. So I, I believe the workforce is transitioning to a different type of workforce. Um, so smart manufacturing technologies, robotics is a huge thing we're looking at. Um, three or four years ago, I would say part of our workforce did a lot of manual um, things. All of those things that we feel can be transitioned with technology are being looked at. Even if the return on investment isn't as great as we would like it to be, we know that we need to have resilience in our manufacturing and our supply chain. And so that has changed how we look at the workforce and what we think the workforce of the future is going to look like. Um, so I think um, 
there hasn't been the greatest understanding of smart manufacturing. I think there's been a renewed focus on how technology and new technologies can enable us to continue to produce products uh, and supply the world with, with food. Thank you so much. So let us now ask questions to Japanese friends, starting with Mr. Ono. A similar question to you. If you look at the current Japanese situation, what is your observation? And after listening to the presentations on U.S. manufacturing, if you have any questions to U.S. friends, you can also ask those questions here. So if you look at Japanese factories, it is not exactly the authentic smart factory. They are focusing on digitalization that is now the target or the goal of manufacturers. Smart manufacturing or smart factory, they haven't been able to reach that level yet. As a result, they tend to be skeptical about the value of digitalization. Maybe this will help reduce the number of people they require, but it is more important for people to be able to use those technologies fully. So it's not that we don't need people for smart manufacturing. I think the role of the people involved will be more important, especially in SMEs. They have limited resources, human resources as well. So the education will be a quite important question for them to be able to improve the business performance. I want to ask a question to our friends of the United States, to Sesmini, to In the past or even now, uh, we learned quite a lot from Germany, but going forward, I really wish to learn from the United States too. So from your viewpoint of the U.S. workforce development, from that perspective, what could be the difference from Germany or Europe? their industry 4.0 and what the advantage that you hold. Yes, maybe. Yeah, John, this is a question we had compared from Germany and Europe. The approach that you take in the United States, is there any difference? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the question. And, and let me say first that, that I think um, I would characterize um, U.S. manufacturers in the same way that you characterized uh, J Japanese manufacturers. There is a huge opportunity to leverage digital technologies, and the adoption rate is is uh, is not great. And and I think that's why, as I mentioned early in my presentation, the productivity, manufacturing productivity, has declined over the last decade, and for the first time in U.S. history. And and um, and and so I think it's vital for us to have these conversations and these collaborations to learn from each other. There is so much that Japan has taught the world, and and so much that we've learned from Japan over the, the past decades. Um, and I love I love your question because it's a it's a practical question. Germany has been uh, leading the the effort on uh, the. The, F, the initiative and investment in the fourth industrial revolution. But as we all know, revolutions in manufacturing don't really happen. This is, their manufacturers are slow to adopt. They're, they're skeptical, like you pointed out, sir. And, and, and the, the reality is we want proven technologies and proven methodologies. Um, if we're going to trust them in our manufacturing plants. And so the last 10 years, I think, has been just the very, very beginning of this journey. 
And I think the next decade is going to be really, really important to see that digital transformation and these technologies and these the evolution of our, our uh, workforce development to really take a hold um, in our manufacturing operations. And so uh, your, your, your question about what can we learn from one another and you know, how is it different from, from the approach that the Germans have taken, um, I, I think the U.S. approach uh, is much more one of a, a tendency towards acting and trying and innovating and either fail quickly and refine the approach or succeed. And, and if we've succeeded, we've succeeded more quickly. And, and so, so I think that's one of the most uh, important observations that I've made in the past number of years are our, our, our opportunity is to really try to drive the acceleration of adopt of adoption of these things and not wait until everything is perfect not wait until all the i's are dotted and t's are crossed as we say and so so our 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 effort here as i mentioned is to accelerate the democratization of smart manufacturing and so um, I, I think our work together with both you and with Germany will, will provide a great combination of expertise and methodologies and this try fast, fail fast, succeed fast approach um, to both the technology, the standards advocacy, as well as the actual um, workforce development and, and training and curriculum that's so necessary for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on to the second question. What is the value of collaboration? I think in the beginning, Mr. Sanguinetti, Mr. Ono, I think I would like to ask two members representing the industry and later maybe I would like to ask Professor Sato. From the viewpoint of enterprise, how will you find the value of collaboration? May I ask you, Mr. Sanguinetti, from the viewpoint of a U.S. company, what's the value of being involved in SESME activities? Sorry, it's a very direct question, maybe, but if I may ask, Joe, please. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I'm going to just maybe talk about one recent activity on collaboration that I think um, has tremendous amount of value. So recently, working with SESME and other members of SESME, uh, so Johnson & Johnson, um, other companies like this, we've come together to talk about supply chain resilience. And working with SESME, the connection with the US government, we, we collaborated on how could we create a supply chain backbone, a digital backbone that allows us to, in a, in a very differential way, collaborate not only with our suppliers, but how do we how do we do that in a way that is efficient, that allows us to see ahead of time where possible supply chain disruptions are going to come? General Mills would never be able to do this on the on our own. As we go into a digital age, we will not be able to make the strides in capabilities working on our own. Collaboration is going to be key collaborating not only with technology companies and, and the, the government like SESME, but also collaborating with other companies um, where we can see mutual benefits um, to basically support not only um, just growing our, our businesses, but when you think about General Mills' mission of supplying the, the, the world with food uh, and nourishing people, that, that was critical as we went into a pandemic, how do we keep the food supply going? 
when you think about Johnson and Johnson and medical things, I mean, those are things that are bigger than just one company. And we have to collaborate in order to do those things. We, we won't be able to do that on our own. So, so to me, uh, that's just one example that we've, we've gone under, you know, just recently in the last six months, which shows, you know, how you, you won't be able to do that on your own. Collaboration is going to be a must. Thank you very much. A very, very insightful explanation you gave us. Uh, Mr. Ono, you said that you have a regional collaboration in Kita Kyushu. Through your activities in the region, do you see any change? Is, the, is your region changing? Yes, thank you very much for your question. I think that the biggest change or the outcome we see is that the region is starting to look towards the same direction as a region. Through so collaboration, it will vitalize our discussion, our communication, and with that communication, I believe conventionally the industry, government, academia, we're moving in all individual ways, but we are starting to be able to look the same way for example, Kita Kyushu System Integrator Network, before our collaboration, we were just competitors, the companies involved. However, we are starting to find out that we can actually fill the gap using our strength and weakness, uh, having an open discussion, we can become a partner. And I think that uh, this has been a very good opportunity and this symposium too, I think we are able to have a really good communication. I think that this type of communication will be a trigger for a new collaboration, which will bring value to all of us. So I hope to have this kind of collaboration and outcome in Kita Kyushu. So I hope that you can keep an eye on us, what we're doing in Kita Kyushu going forward too. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Sato, I would like to ask for skill development. I believe you have an insight for global examples and you have lots of uh, experience in robot, but the approach taken in the United States, I think Mr. Sanginetti explained about collaboration, especially collaboration between different industries that is also important that type of communication and discussion will bring new perspectives so in this kind of approach taking in the united states how should i say what can we learn in japan do you think there's something that we can newly bring into japan dr sato yes I think it is true, collaboration is essential and it is very important. I think Western nations, they are very strong in the cyber world and the information strategy, the United States has always been leading the world and I think they will continue to do so. Japan has conventionally been strong in manufacturing and strong in the actual workplace in the plant. So we have a strength in the physical world. And the Western nations, I believe, have their strength in their cyber world. I think that future manufacturing is not just in the physical world, not just in the cyber world. I think that it is important that it's going to be a world of cyber physical systems. So it will be an integration of both. From that sense, strong in the cyber world, the United States, and cyber strong in the physical world, the Japan, integrating and working together, I think that is indispensable for the future of manufacturing. And if we can have a strong tie between us, it will be a strong force. So as mentioned, I think that the platform of the United States, I think that it is important we can adapt it to the Japanese actual floors and uh, promote DX even further. That's important for us. Thank you for your comment. So let us now move on to the third theme. The third topic is about SME tools and 
efforts, initiatives that can help SMEs. SESME's mission is, at least one of them, is to energize SMEs. As I remember, the SESME's values. So for this topic, representing companies, I'd like to also invite comments from Mr. Ono and Mr. Sanginetti. So we have been discussing smart manufacturing and cyber physical system. This new era has emerged. In such new era, what are some of the challenges of SMEs? What challenges do they face? I think it is good to try to identify the major challenges. You may have your partners that are small and medium-sized companies. Maybe some of your customers are SMEs. One of the major topics that we want to discuss is human development. For small and medium-sized companies to be able to educate their human resources, what are their challenges? If you are to pick one of those major challenges, what would be the major challenge SME is faced with? So I'd like to go to Ms. Ono first. Thank you. We are a small and medium-sized company, so we have lots of challenges. But what is missing is the opportunities. As we have discussed, when you look at smart manufacturing and cyber-physical systems, and recently we are looking at new social issues like decarbonization and SDGs. In manufacturing, we are faced with multiple challenges. Since the size of our company is small, confronted with these grand challenges, we would say we don't have sufficient resources. It's impossible for a small company like us to tackle with these issues. We can't hire, we can't educate, but we still have shortage of labor. Early on, we, I said in my presentation that collaboration can possibly be a solution, a breakthrough. For us to be able to take one step further, we need opportunities. SMEs to be able to find an opportunity or being able to change our mindset so that we can find these opportunities for changes. So, Mr. San Genichi, would you like to also answer the same question? Yeah, and, and I think Mr. Ono said it in his last comment and it's mindset. I, I think that that is the biggest challenge. Um, an opportunity for, I think, small and medium enterprises. The, the opportunity is that you don't have a lot of um, people in the organization that are afraid of change. The, that, you know, when, when I look at um, that challenge, it's going to be, are you able to have a mindset of the future, be able to not do what has been done in the past, but to do it in a different way to get the same results. Um, and, and that's, that's, it's hard to do because you will have a lot of people selling you or telling you how to do things the way they've done it in the past. And they'll, they'll tell you, this is smart manufacturing but it's really what we've done in the past. How do you make that jump to really transform and be transformative? So, the, so the mindset of being able to really make that leap, it'll, it'll be risky. It'll, it'll be scary um, in a sense, but, but I think the agility of small and medium enterprises 
is the opportunity as probably as well as the challenge. Um, but, but I think mindset is going to be the biggest challenge. Thank you. So next, one more thing. Today, Mr. Dyke presented about Sesame's smart manufacturing platform. So using this platform, I think Sesame is promoting the use of this platform. But in the eyes of companies, compared to the separate independent initiative, what are the differences that they can actually find by using this platform compared to their own individual initiative? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and a very important opportunity for me to describe a little more about what, what we're trying to accomplish and, and how we think this is an important part of the innovation that's required to truly transform this marketplace. The One of the core challenges in building a manufacturing system, whether it's around quality or maintenance or productivity or predictive analytics, machine learning, um, one of the basic challenges is the complexity of connecting to equipment, which is mostly commoditized, but doing so in a way that we can extract information in consistent and standardized ways that don't force an implementer to redo and recreate that information model over and over again in every technology for every application. And so the SESME Smart Manufacturing Innovation Platform is a, a thin but vital layer of infrastructure that we want to give to the industry that commoditizes that layer of data contextualization so that every other platform and every other vendor can leverage that standardized um, contextualization layer for their purposes so that they become better, so that they can demonstrate faster time to value. I love the, 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 way, the idea of MUDA uh, and eliminating waste in manufacturing processes. We, we see this step, the data contextualization piece, as a great way to eliminate the waste of repeated effort um, in the data contextualization component. So if we can commoditize that in a way that the industry can use for every platform, for every product, for every solution, and for a whole new generation of application developers, right? There's, there needs to be innovation at the application uh, development layer as well. We need, we need many, many more innovative people empowered to build new types of applications and to take the innovation that's in their mind and, and simply, simply translate that into an innovative application of some sort. That's going to require, we believe, this, this, uh, the commoditization of this con data contextualization piece. That way we can build applications that are portable, applications that are repeatable, and eliminate the waste in that um, infrastructure layer. So that's the that's the, what's behind the the thinking of the innovation platform, and part of our effort to drive transformation in this space. Thank you very much. Here we have questions coming in from the audience. So I would like to take some questions. To Professor Sato, Robert Industry, through several decades, 
there were lots of challenges. At first, it was a real, real prototype. We didn't know if it will work, develop the market, talent development, and Japan is able to become a leading nation in robots. But for industrial IoT, the speed of evolution is very fast. So where should we focus when we try to do talent development? I think it means there are various new technologies coming in, and maybe it's hard to f understand where to focus because there are so many new technologies. We're too busy when we try to catch up with the new technology. Is there any other way? And there was like, do we need a basic engineering power or a system type of thinking? Where should we focus? Any advice? Yes, it's an era of science and technology, it's often said, but I think when science and technology, I think currently it is becoming more matured, which means the basic science and technology, we already have the foundation for many things. So that basic science and technology, the elemental technology is being combined, I think uh, new values are created. I think now we are at an era where it's important that we combine and with that combination, technology accelerates and uh, things we learn become outdated very quickly. Quickly, then what's important for education in current days? I think it's important that we learn through challenges, which means we don't always succeed. If we fail, we sometimes fail, we sometimes succeed, but when we fail, we understand what we are lacking and we can find out what we must learn, which means it's an education where we learn what to learn or how to learn. I think that learning about how to learn is the challenge education I just mentioned. And another point is we have to continue to learn. For from higher education specialists, they say the experts say that it was how much we learned in the past, but from now on, it's about how much learning we continue. So that's why I said a recurrent education, continuing to learn throughout our life, that is extremely important. So to summarize, I think it's learning about how to learn and education to learn how to continuously learn. That is the two important points. Thank you. Maybe we can take one more question from the audience. This is a question to the experts from the United States. U.S. and Japan talent development, I think it was one of today's important topic, but I think that the flow uh, the flux of the talent how much they move is different between japan and united states in japan still people tend to stay in one company for a long period of time on the other hand in the united states i think compared to japan uh, people change their jobs more frequently so in this type of environment uh, organic talent development and the skilled appropriate talent, uh, hiring them that appropriate timing. I think there could be two different way of thinking. So organically developing the talent you hold or hiring talents whenever you need them. So what kind of combination do you have? May I ask Mr. Sanguinetti first? What is the way of thinking in your company or maybe in the United States? So I, very good question. Thank you. Um, and I can speak for General Mills. So I've worked at General Mills for almost 28 years. Um, and we are seeing a difference in workforce or that talent, um, where we're seeing more people um, not staying with the company, like myself for 28 years, but moving more. So I, I believe General Mills approach is to take advantage of both. Mm to take advantage of the stability and the knowledge 
of core technologies um, that we have. So for, for example, myself with 28 years working in several manufacturing facilities, I have a lot and broad base of understanding of General Mills systems and those types of things. With that though, having new uh, talent come in with new ideas, new ways of looking at it is, is going to be the way of the future. We want to have that stability and not lose all the learnings we've had, but also be able to have that fresh set of eyes or a different approach to come in and, and look at that. I think where General Mills will really shine is having people that stay with the company that have a growth mindset, have that mindset that they're continuously learning. They want to look at new ideas and having new people come in and look at things differently, having different skill sets and, and bringing in things that, that show other people uh, things are possible to do differently and could be a lot better. So I, I, I agree. I believe the question around um, we will see a change and it'll be a hybrid approach of growth mindset of individuals within the company that have stayed there a long time and uh, new people coming in with also growth mindsets that really want to learn. Thank you very much. How about you, John? Do you think that is the future trend too? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a, a great question, and, and I think a really important one for us to consider. Um, and, and I want to take a slightly different perspective, um, looking out to the future. Um, we talked about smart manufacturing 2030, where over the course of this decade, we believe that smart manufacturing will be manufacturing, that all manufacturers have the opportunity to to, to be part of this evolution, not, not revolution. And, and from, a, from a workforce perspective, I think on the plant floor, we have to begin behaving in ways similar to where IT or to what IT has been doing for the last two decades. IT 20 years ago began solving basic fundamental infrastructure challenges to standardize how devices communicate, to create plug and play um, uh, frameworks and to drive and support open source for solving these some of these grand, in, in their scheme, grand challenges from an IT perspective. And, and yet on the plant floor, it seems like every machine builder and every vendor thinks that they have to develop their own way to communicate and their own way to express information and their own way to um, try to capitalize on information and make it proprietary and keep it proprietary. So I think over the course of the next decade, um, to build a standardized set of capabilities to work together to solve these problems means that if I have talent that, that comes in from the outside, there will at least be a baseline of common standardized way of, of dealing with problem solving and solving um, mm -hmm. and, and adding value and creating value for my organization based on those standardized layers of infrastructure. So, so I, I realize that's kind of a one niche, but I, but I think fundamentally, if we're going to engage our workforce more effectively as, as that, and I think the future does mean there will be more mobility and certainly in the US and I think perhaps even more broadly, that there will be more mobility within the workforce. We have to find ways to empower that workforce and in ways that are more standardized, at least at, at the le level where there, there's, uh, uh, there, there ought not to be a sense of proprietary or differentiation at the infrastructure level. So, so I think that that's going to facilitate uh, a workforce, the workforce of the future, I think that can, that can play a much more integral role in problem solving. We talk about the citizen technologist, the average worker on the plant floor. We want to empower them regardless of where they've come from or where they go. And, and I think 
working collaboratively to create that foundation of uh, tool sets and infrastructure and standards will be one of the big things in the next decade that allows us that mobile workforce to add more value regardless of where they go or where they've come from. Thank you so much. We'll be able to see what will be needed in the future. Thank you very much for your useful suggestion. We have received many questions, but because of the time constraints, we will not be able to deal with uh, any more of these questions. But those questions that are asked and not answered on a later date will be having our speakers answer those questions and questions will be on our website. So let us now go to the last topic. This is about collaboration between RRI and Sesame on smart manufacturing. This will be the global collaboration. So this is also for the wrap up part of the discussion. I'd like to invite every speaker to make a comment on this topic. Throughout the presentations and panel discussion, we have been able to discuss smart manufacturing. We've been able to deepen our understanding. RRI, says me, and the member companies have been working separately up until today, but we believe that we better understand each other as a result of today's discussion as well. In the beginning, Mr. Dykes said that SESME and RRI will collaborate on workforce development and smart manufacturing technology development, as well as standardization and also sustainable business as well. We actually made the announcement today. So lastly, I want to invite your comments especially what you expect out of this collaboration between RRI and SESME. Starting with Mr. Dyke, please. Yeah, as I said before, um, we are truly honored to begin this collaboration uh, in a very public way with the nation of Japan and with a great team there at RRI. Um, We've talked a lot about some of the basic ideas that, that I think will enable us to collaborate um, going forward. Um, I've really appreciated the, the, the comments from my fellow panelists here. Uh, there's this tremendous depth and insight uh, just, just on this panel, which I think bodes really well for, for the, the types of problems that we can work on together. We've highlighted specifically um, shared interests around educational benchmarking and the, the sort of workforce development activities and upskilling activities that are essential. Um, we've talked broadly about technical standards as being a, a key area of focus for us, working on common sets of um, frameworks and taxonomies, ontologies, ways of, ways of at the infrastructure layer at the very least, um, advocating for common ways of of information modeling and the expression of, of uh, information from machines, from robots, from machine tools, from a packaging line, from a paper converting machine, Re regardless of the kind of equipment, manufacturing equipment or process that, that you represent in your organization, we need to work on harmonized ways to express information and then leverage those information uh, components in, in much more standardized ways. And last but not least, we talked a little bit about fostering sustainable production and, and the, the very grand challenge of decarbonization, which is clearly a, a major priority of the administration here in the US and, and in most uh, developed countries. And, and so these are all areas where um, the individual nations that we represent will have significant effort and will, will invest uh, significantly to, to advance, but um, because, in fact, as, as Joe Sanguinetti mentioned, um, there are global manufacturing companies. Many of the many of the manufacturing organizations that are members here and, and that are members uh, and part of the RRI team 
they're global manufacturers. And so if we're working on all of these important strategic efforts in a vacuum, we're going to be further complicating what these challenges represent for those global manufacturing organizations. And so working together to harmonize the key fundamental efforts in these areas, working together to make sure at the very least that we do no harm, but I think more, more optimistically that we can actually accelerate, work on accelerating each other's efforts uh, along common pathways and common frameworks and advocating for common harmonization here. I think this is what's in front of us. And this is, this is how we can engage the, the machine builders from Japan, from Germany, from, from the United States to work on these efforts together. The vendors, the, the manufacturers sharing their experiences and sharing their, their learnings and sharing um, the, the things that they've developed across the board. That sounds a little altruistic, but I think if we can work on these things together, there's so much that we can accomplish that individually we, we, uh, we will fall short. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Sato to make a comment. I am repeating myself, but in the US and EU, they have strengths in the information strategy. So they are good at making standards like Industry 4.0 that's been proposed in the Western countries. In the United States, they are good at making platforms and tools, as you just explained. They are very good at building a common framework. On the other hand, Japan is good at making things in the factory floor. So that's, again, the physical world. That's our battlefield. But Japan can also play an important role so from the by looking at smart manufacturing it's a cyber physical system the western companies that is good at information strategy can work with japanese companies to deploy this concept of smart manufacturing i think it's essential i think that is going to happen in the future in terms of human development conventionally japan had a unique working environment. But we have to also introduce a new way of using workforce, hiring people when they need them. And by having this fusion, we'll be able to utilize our strengths to a larger extent. I have great expectation out of this future vision. Now, Mr. Ono, would you also like to share with us your comment? Thank you for today. I was able to listen to your presentation. I really enjoyed the presentations and panel discussion. Maybe we are different in terms of the size of the country, the size of the companies, but we do have common set of problems. In that sense, RRI and SESME collaboration, which was announced today, is going to be a major force into the future. As I said early on, regional collaboration is important for us. And again, we understand how communication is important. Furthermore, if there is a great impact coming from regional collaboration, certainly you can expect more impact from Japan-US collaboration, RRI and SISME collaboration. We are a member of this regional collaboration in order to accelerate our activities. We still lack tools and platforms to make that acceleration 
But we are hoping through this Japan-US collaboration, we would like to see more tools and platforms that are available for SMEs. Being able to learn more from this collaboration in terms of workforce development as well. As I mentioned early on, we have system Kitakyushu System Integrators Network, the regional collaboration network. We'd like to see some of those tools and platforms. We would like to introduce them on a trial basis. Maybe Kitakyushu Sesame style something we would like to establish that in the region. I'd love to take a plane to meet you, Mr. Dyke, if, if I could. We will find a way to make that happen. That would be fantastic. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity today. Lastly, Mr. Sanguniti, would you also like to share your comment with us? Yes, first of all, thank you very, very much for allowing me to participate in this. This has been fascinating and educational for me. Um, I, I'll, I'll begin to say, you know, General Mills was a founding member of SESME, so we strongly believe in collaboration uh, and very excited to see the collaboration of SESME continue to expand as they started a relationship and in, in the partnership with with Europe and Industry 4.0 and now with, with Japan and, and RI. So those are incredible. I'm also, um, I think, very excited about um, not only smart manufacturing technology, but the technology that's going to allow us to collaborate even more. Um, for example, I, I only speak English, but with technology coming, it won't matter. I'll be able to converse and collaborate with other people that maybe don't speak English, but can have automatic translation, all those types of things. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, I'll just reiterate what John had talked about. Collaboration is going to take a, a, a core set of, of kind of standards or understanding. So for me, an example would be uh, we all use, Ethernet or networking, there there isn't value in creating your own type of network. the The value is building on top of that technology and adding value. I I, I hope we start trying to not create proprietary capabilities, but leverage those standards and then just drive the the innovation and the value on top of those standards so people can easily consume them. Um, it's going to be an incredible future with the technologies that are coming out. So I'm, I'm very excited, was super, extremely happy to participate on this. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a very dis fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. And especially members from the United States. I know it's very early in the morning. Thank you very much for being with us. Day two, it was about two hours, but we were able to have presentations and discussions about talent development and smart manufacturing, not just in the plants, but interaction with various stakeholders. So talent development in a wide range of areas. And from the floor to management, not just for individual companies, but it is a challenge throughout the industry. That is a learning we had. And to work on that, the importance of collaboration and the value of it, including the collaboration of industry, government, and academia. We were able to receive lots of insightful comments. And in SMEs, the challenges of talent development was also shared. RRI and SESME, we are going to collaborate. We were able to announce that today. And 
we were able to hear lots of high expectations for the future. This is something we must work on through collaboration. Finally, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to all the presenters today once again and close day two. To presenters and audience, thank you very much for being with us. Let's conclude day two of the Robot Revolution Industrial IoT International Symposium. Thank you. Bye. Ah, Excuse me, I missed something. I forgot to talk about day three tomorrow. Yes. 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. JST. The theme is data exchange and data quality. So we have another set of presentations and discussions for two hours tomorrow and we have day four day after tomorrow i think so i would like to see you all again tomorrow thank you very much